gun giveaway. Well, now that I have your attention, the Your Mountain Podcast is working with Gunworks, Vortex Optics, Federal Premium Ammunition, Viking Tactics, Proof Research, Timely Triggers, and Magpul to put together a package of the components necessary for you to build a better gun. Go to www.itsyourmountain.com and look for the gun giveaway on our website. There you can find out how to enter in addition to review the rules and restrictions to this gun giveaway. Make sure you get your entry in by May 1st, 2019. So head on over to www.itsyourmountain.com. Now on to the show. There are millions of acres of opportunity out there. They belong to you. Every day decisions are being made that affect your land, your water, your wildlife. You should know about them. This is your mountain. Hey everybody, David Wilms here again, Nephi Cole here again, Mike McGrady not here again. Ha <laughs> Mike, you need a different job. <laughs> it's uh, I, I said that in the, with all the love in the world. No, you didn't. Uh, we're here, <laughs> we're here, uh, do another episode of the Your Mountain Podcast, um, and Mike is not where we are right now. And we probably could have coordinated with him and tried to call him. In he didn't on want this. us to do that. He told me. Did he really? Yes. He, he just said, doesn't want to be a part of this. He'd anymore? probably call me a liar now, but I'm pretty sure. No, it's just he didn't want to. Like, Mike's got a real life. He's got a job. And <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 what do we have? <laughs> well, jobs in real lives, but sometimes we get to our jobs put us in the same place at the same time. So, which is what's happened today. Yes. Right? And Mike's does not put him in that same place with us because he's busy fighting for the torts of the world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's an ambulance chaser, torts glorified are, ambulance are, chaser. For yeah. those that are not familiar what a tort is. It's a delicious That is called a, a frequently oh, known as an ambulance chaser. Yes. Right? Well, that's what Mike's doing. Yep, he is. God bless him, um, Mike. No, he's he's missed. He's always missed when he's not here. He he adds um he adds the levity to the conversation. Yes, he, does. he reigns us in when we start yes. you know, going places that maybe we shouldn't go. Um uh, telling and, stories that make no sense. Yeah, which I guarantee will probably happen tonight. Maybe I'll fill that in for you guys. What the the the, the random stories. stories and the levity. I, I I think that'd be great. Yeah. Um, but, no, I'll do the but, stories. But be, before I'll do the random stories here. Bef, bef, <laughs> before that, uh, this strange voice just appeared. Uh, that it's much better radio voice than mine. It's a way better. You should be hosting this show. You're the host now. <laughs> yeah, you're the host. Yeah. New job. You're in charge of this. John, take it from here. Uh, first, start by introducing yourself. <laughs> Thanks, fellas. Uh, I'm John Gale. I'm with Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. I'm the conservation director. I oversee our policy and government relations, and uh, I've been in conservation for my entire career. Um, started, kind of cut my teeth with Trout Unlimited in Washington, D.C., and uh, before that, I was overseas doing conservation work in northern Africa, and uh, eventually found my way out of the international development world back into the continental conservation community here in North America, and happy to be with BHA Raising the flag across two different countries, we're present in both Canada and the United States, and uh, it's an exciting time to be in the, the conservation world for sure. So, so I thanks for having gonna, me tonight. When are you going to have a chapter in Northern mm-hmm. Africa? Maybe someday. Uh, we, we aspire to, to greatness, but that's a long way away. Well, we have our hands full with uh, just uh, being in North America right now. That's got to be a lot more entertaining. Hey, we do have something in common. All of us have disturbing connections to the same state. It's kind of like Kevin Bacon. I, I want to, yeah. Can you hold that thought for one second? I can. Um, I'll try and remember to come back you, to it, and there'll will. be a point. Yeah, you will. And I, and I know there'll be a point to it. Uh, but John piqued my interest here. What in the world did you do in Northern Africa? And in, you know, can you say what country you were in? Yeah. And, you know, what kind of, what kind of, of work were you doing? Were you working for the State Department? And <laughs> yeah, I was working for the State Department. Were you doing conservation for the CIA? Yeah. yeah that's what everyone thought I was doing. I arrived in the, I arrived in Morocco carrying a, a small black case. It was actually it's a good a, story a, so far. A, a medical like kit uh, that was substantial medical kit. It was designed to last me for a couple of years, 
It looked like something that you would have a weapon in. It looked like a black <laughs> weapons case, like mm-hmm. maybe a Pelican case that you I'm, would have. I'm on board. You would have like a, uh, uh, some type of automatic weapon in. And uh, I love this job. I, I roll into a tiny mountain village carrying this black case and a backpack, and I'm a giant white guy in the middle of nowhere. And I also happen to speak Arabic. You're a movie star right now, and and uh, and so 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 instead of- <laughs> you speak, you have a voice like this. You worked in Northern Africa. You speak Arabic. Uh, okay, now lie to us so, and tell so, us what you so tell I, us something that's I, a lie for what so, you really so everyone doing. Does, everyone thinks that I am like a CIA agent, right? Like because we're like, what are you doing here? Is the first question, right? Do you have a car that shoots fire? And uh, <laughs> you're, like, you're like, I came to learn about your culture and, uh, and find ways I can help your community. Like, of course, I sound like a CIA agent. <laughs> I, I actually uh, I, I joined the Peace Corps out of college and uh, I wanted to serve my country, but uh, the, the military didn't feel right at the time. And I come from a, a family of uh, proud servants of both the, the Navy and the Air Force. And, um, and so... I wanted to do my part too. And the, the Peace Corps felt like the right thing for me at that time. I wanted to go live in a foreign country, learn a new language, um, do something to delay the inevitable reality of actually functioning as an adult in the real world, uh, saving up for a 401k, having a job. Yeah. And, and you see, Dave, you didn't ever have to do that. <laughs> but go ahead. So uh, I, I, I joined the Peace Corps and I was stationed in Morocco and I was there to do natural resources projects. Uh, my background in college doing natural resource management issues lended itself well to that country. And uh, that's just where I got put. And it was phenomenal. It was a really great experience. And uh, and, it, and it became like kind of a dramatic ending. Um, I was there during 9-11. And so I, I left our country in one state and I returned to it in a different state. Um, and it was different. There was different security protocols. I had weird stuff in my backpack, like like daggers and uh, giant like metal things that I had acquired over there. That like all of a sudden were not allowed to be transported on airplanes unless you checked them. And so so I had this like goofy uh, reintegration back into our own culture. It was like reverse culture shock. But while I lived there, it was it was fantastic. Um, we were actually evacuated when we went to war in Iraq in two thousand three and. They evacuated all non-essential U.S. personnel out of Morocco, and uh, part of me was annoyed that I was considered non-essential. But uh, safety first, right? Uh, follow the rules, and and uh, we were evacuated to Washington D.C., and that kind of stumbled me into the conservation world I live in now. I did a short stint with an NGO called Save the Children, and we were doing like neonatal health work and places like Cochabamba, Bolivia, and India. Wasn't that Michael Jackson? Didn't he do something for Save the Children? <laughs> no, no. Uh, that was his song about save the world, make it a better place. Oh, he, he didn't actually <laughs> save children, did he? <laughs> <laughs> I, this Ooh. is getting into questionable podcast territory, right? Well, this was an excellent, excellent story. Uh, I prefer, I'm going to write the, from now we on. We can swerve into another lane now, no, right? From now on, you, <laughs> from now on you are a spy. Like in our world, we're going we're gonna to tell people, yeah, so John, yeah. And then he lies and he's like, oh yeah. And then I just came home. Like, sure you were Arabic guy with the black suitcase. <laughs> you know what? You were doing nothing creepy. You were doing like, it was all on the up and up. I, I got to tell a joke about the spy thing. Mm-hmm. We've talked about this before, right? I don't think so. No? <laughs> no. Um, my mom was in the CIA. Station in, pa- oh, wow. station in Pakistan. Yeah, cool. In the seventies, which the- is why Dave does not look like his dad. <laughs> <laughs> I I thought his beard was really full. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So she she was this, um, you know, she was this girl from Bond, uh, James Bond agent movie, yeah, yeah. James Bond movie. A graduate of the University of Idaho. Mm-hmm. That's where I went to college too. Really? I swear. Yeah, that's yeah where my, Moscow. Go Vandals. That's, that's where my parents met. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so my mom went to college there, and then she, uh, you know, joined the CIA and wound up in Pakistan for several years. And she used to tell me these stories about um, it was during a civil war between what's now Bangladesh yeah. uh, and Pakistan. That it was at the time Pakistan and East Pakistan were were fighting this civil war, and you know she described these stories of when they had, the bombing raids would come through. Uh, they'd have to. They'd have 
the whole city would have blackouts. Right? And the blackouts might go, might be all night because you didn't know, you, you wanted to make your city as invisible as possible back right. then, right? Uh, and she said just to try and get through the nights because there's no way she could go sleep. Uh, to get through the nights, she'd sit in a closet, close the door of the closet, get a flashlight, and just read by flashlight hmm. you know, while the bombs were dropping you know, all around. Uh, and you know, kind of described those those stories. I used to take her to show and tell. Uh, <laughs> she has when a little children. When I was a when I was a, when I was a, uh, a kid. This and, explains a you lot. Know, her her favorite way to to end the presentation was, well, I hope you learned a lot, and uh, now I have to kill you all. You know. <laughs> well, welcome We're, to Dave's that, childhood. That landed well in first grade, right? Yeah, we. <laughs> they're we, like, we ah! were, yeah, we worked on the you know, delivery. It got better. You can't do that anymore. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like that's, for anybody listening, that's not the way you finish up your kids. Uh, but she doesn't anymore. speak Arabic. I, I think that's the thing that triggered me most about what you said. You, it's, is that is did you pick that up when you were over there? Did you did you know Arabic before you? No, I, I picked it up as soon as I got in the country. I spoke a little bit of French when I got there. And Morocco is a former French protectorate, and so there is a lot of remnants of that within the 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 culture and the, the language of the country and. The official government language um, is French, and so there, there are remnants of that. But when I went there, I consciously made a decision that I didn't want to use French as a crutch to get by. I wanted to get fully immersed in the culture and learn to speak their language. and And their version of Arabic is different than what you would hear in Saudi Arabia or the Middle East. Uh, it's called Derija, and it's like a Northern African dialect. So if I was speaking to someone. Uh, from Tunisia, which actually I, I ran into someone from Tunisia a couple weeks ago, and uh, I was able to communicate with them, and they understood what I was saying. And it's a regional dialect that steals a lot from classical Arabic, but it's it's unique and different. And so I sat in a lot of rug shops, uh, drank a lot of coffee in coffee shops, and just wanted to learn it right away, and I ended up picking it up pretty fast. But I probably still spoke like a, a kindergartner and you didn't have to wait very long before you got into some deep conversation before you realized the limitations of my language <laughs> ability but like the uh the the niceties of day-to-day -day life like oh are you a moroccan guy like sometimes i would get that like I, I spoke it well enough to be passable but like it would always pique people's interest because like i'm a big white dude that stuck out with like a, a crate with a with a weird black suitcase. Yeah, right. Like uh, I didn't Pelican carry it case. with me every day, but like landing in the the community that I I eventually lived in, and everyone's paying attention, right? Because like you know, it's unusual. And nobody tried to rob your house. Ever. No, no, I was See? I was super safe the whole time. Uh, so last thing we, before we get back to off this tangent, back to what Nephi was going to say. Uh, so I want to hear you, I'm assuming you just carried on a conversation a couple weeks ago. If I were to say, ask for you to, there's a, there's a phrase I like, to, I think is important to know in about every language Yeah. Uh, when you're traveling. Uh, there's one sentence that, I mean, a lot of people want to know, you know, where's the nearest restaurant or where's the bathroom. But I think it's pretty important to be able to say, where are my pants? And so, um, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> this happens to, at least for Dave. Like you just this actually's <laughs> never happened to me on a business trip, Dave. You just never so know. So I'm curious as to why, like this consistently, you, wherever you go, you have to ask where you your pants are. You just never know. It's a it's an important sentence to have in in your how uh, many times in your hip pocket. I don't want to know. Uh, so could you would you be able to say where are my pants in uh, in Arabic? Well, depending on where you <laughs> live at in the country, <laughs> they might say like fin pantalon diali, like they borrow heavily from Spanish and French. Okay. So. That might be one way they would say it. Oh, okay. They would say pantalon. Like, yeah. fin is like, where? Good pantalon. enough for me. Diali, like, they belong to me. It's funny. Like it. In Portuguese, you say, de dia. <laughs> See, I thought, it, like, in Spanish, it's, donde están mis pantalones. Huh. Right? Yeah. Um, in yeah. Portuguese, we say, calces. Hmm? Forget it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not important. But Idaho is important. So all of us yes, have this kind of thing in common. So you said you went to the, U, the University of Idaho in yep. Moscow, yep. which I went to for a soils competition once. We can talk about some other time because it's very fascinating. Soils um, competition is big business in places like Idaho. Let me tell you, nothing is quite as uh, interesting as uh, some analytic soils. Yeah. But moving on from that, um, 
Oh, sorry. Sorry. So I graduated from high school (laughs) in Idaho, and Dave wishes he graduated from high school in Idaho. I did not graduate. Might be a better person because of it. Yeah, my family roots are in Idaho. Both both sides of my both both my parents were born in Idaho. Uh, Mom's side homesteaded Idaho. We have a homestead in Idaho as well. Uh, Back in the day, we uh, I consider myself a fifth generation Idahoan. Uh, There's a cool family photo of us back in the day. It's a so actually a five generation photo of me with. Uh, when I was a baby with my parents and all five generations in one photo. Uh, pretty cool moment. And now that my sister has had children in Idaho, there's the sixth generation is out there. And I'm the only one that's ever been silly enough to leave Idaho along the way. I'd love you to, I'd love to go, go back that one day. Far. You didn't I, go that far. Well, I, I did take well, a except, circ- except Morocco. I, that was, I, that's pretty far. Yeah. I, did, I did go to Morocco and then to D.C. and then eventually made my way back to Colorado. So I, I'm inching closer back to the home state. Yeah. But I do miss it. And, um, you know, I uh, my dad was a cheesemaker, actually. He went to University of Idaho, too. And uh, I wonder if our parents were there at the same time. Making they may cheese. have been. We're about the same age, <laughs> I, I think. I think so, yeah. Uh, my dad uh, – Got his degree in food science. He was a ranch kid. We had a dairy farm yeah. in Meridian, Idaho. That's awesome. And uh, I spent my entire childhood either on the dairy farm of my grandparents in Meridian, Idaho, or on the dairy farm of my uncle in uh, Middleton, Idaho. And we got into so much trouble out there, you know, milking cows. And and, and the, <laughs> the dairy farms are gone now. You know, we're in like cow-calf operations and doing yeah. grass-fed beef and we're on that whole track now, but man, I had, I think some of the best times of my life were on the farms and ranches growing up where self-reliance becomes not something you learn because you wanted to, but because you find yourself in trouble and you have to fish yourself out of it. And there's no one else around you because that time in our lives, uh, some might consider it irresponsible parenting by now. No, I, I think that it was the way to grow up and live. Like, it was okay to be unsupervised for some of your time and, and being out there yeah. and finding yourself in some trouble moments, but it was still safe enough that you could find your way out of it. And you always knew how to get back to the ranch house. And there, there was always a telephone at some point in time in case 911 had to enter into the equation. You know, Utah actually passed a bill for, to allow for, for, to protect free range parenting. That's yeah, so, funny. so explain that because I, I saw that. Yeah, so here's the deal. It's like in so many places now, they're like the modern parenting theory, and I totally buy into this is what it is. Like people now, the, our, as our society's gotten more money, there's this, like everybody has changed the way they parent. Like they put yeah. a huge amount of resources into each child and a huge amount of time. And and growing up, and I grew up in, in had, you know, in, in that kind of area of Idaho where I was getting in trouble doing all the same stuff, like... Whether well, it's floating down irrigation ditches, oh, yeah. which now you know nobody would ever dream of letting a <laughs> child like blow up an, an old car inner tube and just like go down an irrigation ditch, right? Or a piece or, of old plywood like yeah. clinging onto it for dear life. <laughs> we did the th- we like stole a pickup hood, right? And you spin yeah. it over and then you drag it behind another truck like a giant sleigh. Do you, know? you guys know the term hooky bobbing? By oh, the way, oh yeah. All right, no, no, no. What's that? You, you don't know what hooky bobbing is, Dave? No. So, where did you grow up? I feel like I mean, maybe I pro- this is an I probably, Idaho. I probably do, but I you probably know, have a different know, term for it. If, once I describe the practice of hooky bobbing, you will know exactly what it is. You may even have your own term for it. But I feel like maybe this is like a purely Idaho term, Nephi, because I use this term in Colorado and everywhere I've been, and no one knows what I'm talking about. The practice of hooky bobbing is dragging some type of thing like an old truck hood behind a vehicle it could be an old sled, but it has to be drug behind a car or a tractor or a motorcycle or Usually, some type of motorized yeah. vehicle during the winter time with an old piece of rope. Usually, an old, an old piece roping. of rope, probably frayed, yeah. probably not entirely safe, but oh, incredibly yeah. fun. And uh, I don't uh, think we had a name for that. We called it we hooky just, bobbing. We just did it. Well, yeah. we did it with the horses too sometimes. Um, there's an event in Saratoga. Yes. Wyoming. Have you seen that event? I heard about it. I was like, I want to enter it like, with the skis behind the horse. Yeah. I'm, like, I'm like, man, I'd be really good at that, I think. <laughs> I'm like, I'm a pretty good skier, and I know my way around the left side of a horse pretty well, too. So I think we could get into that. Yeah, so we did the uh, – um, 
like so free range parenting getting back to that well so what that is is just basically saying parents like you can't uh be charged for child endangerment because you let your kids go be kids because in places now like that's you know somebody would freak out about those kinds of things and apparently some legislators in Utah thought it was imparent, uh, you know I- important that in some places and, and families where parents thought that that was an appropriate way just to let their kids grow up and get a cut you know, or, you know, or experience adversity that they get to do that. I, I think that's probably how we all grew up. Yeah. I've told you the story of how I, so uh, stop me when I, when it's like, I probably repeated this a thousand okay. times. I don't know. Uh, but my neighbors, when I was a kid, had a pond, right, uh, behind their place. And, you know, the rule in our house was. Uh, don't we, drown. No, the rule, yeah, kind of. <laughs> but the rule, rule in our house, we had a. The second rule. We had a great big, <laughs> great big bell. And you had yeah. to be in earshot of that the, bell mm-hmm. uh, oh, yeah. to be able to get back to the same rule as like my dad's whistle. Yeah. 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 Ours yeah. was a car horn. <laughs> so th- so <laughs> this, this pond was in earshot of that bell. And I'd go to that bo- pond all the time. And, uh, uh, you, know, one, er, you know, when I was probably, I don't know, six or seven years old, I took mason jars. And, you know, like a kid is likely to do, you take a mason jar out and you're going out to catch tadpoles and things yeah. like that. And so I got out there and I was wading around the pond and I was. I was catching tadpoles, and uh, I must have had 50 or 60 tadpoles in a single mason jar. Uh, and I, I took it back home, and I, you know, punched the holes in the top, right? Get, let's get some air in there and whatnot. And uh, I, I watched those tadpoles, and I'm like, when are they going to start growing legs? And, <laughs> uh, and they did. Like two, three days later, they started growing legs. Ah, oh, childhood. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but... <laughs> Turns out they weren't tadpoles. <laughs> uh, they grew legs, and then they grew wings. Uh, and it turns out I had just brought all of this mosquito larva into my house <laughs> and poked holes in the mason jar. So we had swarms of mosquitoes <laughs> flying around our house. Because, you know, the larva just, what, your little mosquito larva when you're that age, it just looks like a little tadpole. And That's pretty funny. <laughs> And you punch a little hole in there, and that's just enough for all these things to get out. So, um, you know, free range childhood. Free range, free range childhood sometimes has some consequences. <laughs> so, back on subject, which I don't know. Are remember we on a subject yet? I know you're telling random stories that don't mean anything. That's my job. <laughs> but we were talking. Uh, so, you represent backcountry hunters and anglers. Yeah. The policy shop. Yep. Now, this is going to blow a lot of people away, but when you came in, you weren't a giant gap tooth Norwegian. <laughs> Are you a friend of my boss, Lantani? Yeah. I don't know if he's actually Norwegian or not, but uh, he does have a, a slight gap tooth between his teeth. I, I think it's yeah. an endearing quality, and people oh, definitely me, know him for everybody it. Everybody knows Lantani. And I bring this up because everybody. I believe he's like, an Irishman. Wait, who? He's a proud Land. Irishman. I don't What? Yeah, sure, Who? whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I think that that's, you know, um, I want to ask you some true or false questions and just some questions about, you know, backcountry hunters and anglers because I think everybody, like, Land has been, like, Land's the, like, he's he's the public face, correct? A lot of people know know him. They see him like, oh, backcountry hunters and anglers. He gets a lot of attention. Yeah, I was, uh, so I've been with backcountry hunters and anglers for a long time. As an organization, we started around a campfire in the, the South Cascades of Oregon in 2004, Really cool story. A bunch of great hunters and anglers came together, and they wanted to build an organization that cared about all things wild, not a single species, not a single way of harvesting species, bring the bow hunters together, bring the gun hunters together, bring everyone that loves to fish and enjoy the backcountry, like the people that were really in those like special places where you find solace and that quiet solitude that is so refreshing. Um, I personally go to the backcountry and, and wilderness areas. That's, that's where I kind of go to get my, my boots dirty and my mind clear. And it's a special place to me. And I think a lot of people share in that vision. And so I wasn't around the original campfire myself, but I smelled the smoke and I came running pretty quick because I thought it was a pretty cool idea. And I joined the the leadership of the Colorado chapter here where I live in Pine Junction, Colorado. And over time, uh, a lot of us helped contribute to the growth of the organization and raising money and awareness and membership. And there was this great organic growth that happened along the way around the country. And we found ourselves raising enough money that we could hire some real staff. We're like, man, we got enough money. We could 
actually hire someone to work for us. That would be pretty amazing. And uh, it wasn't long after that that we decided to conduct a, a real robust search for an executive director, and I sat on that search committee. And uh, Lantani and I actually were colleagues at the time. We'd been working together and been friends for a while. And um, and he uh, kind of shook out of that process as the, the, the number one candidate. So we hired him, and he came on board and really built the organization up from there. And we've had explosive growth ever since. And after he was in that CEO role for a couple of years and helped uh, create new resources and, uh, and and create that strong fire in the belly and the, the energy that continues to grow at BHA. He asked me to come on board and set up policy shop and government relations shop and help fill that part of the organization out as, as we were trying to work with decision makers, both the state and local level, but also back in Washington, D.C., and and that's kind of like where my background was. And so you predate land. In some ways at BHA, I definitely do. So you're, you're pre-land, you helped hire land, and then ended up, now you have to work for him. That's got to be tough. It's not Because land is like, did he's just, almost intolerable. Did you just, did you just, uh, like you almost went and compared land to Jesus. <laughs> Did I really? Because that's not the intent here. The, yeah, yeah. Before pre-land, land, yeah. pre-land. BL. It's like BA. Yeah. But yeah. no, like, I, I think that there's yeah. if if land BL and A A L. Yeah, if land's listening, he's probably going to adopt that. He's like, this is amazing. This is the way you have to refer to me from <laughs> now on. So, la- <laughs> so I'll you know ask you a few questions. I mean, land. Yeah. To be frank, and he knows. I think so, I think he'd argue that at times he's been a firebrand. He's a passionate guy. Land, um, you know, is is you know. I, I don't think he has, he's worked on some political campaigns and in political areas that people would classify probably as, you know, Democrats, true or false. You have to be a Democrat to join backcountry hunters and anglers. Completely false. We actually did a, a really cool demographic study recently that analyzed our membership because we wanted to really know what constituency we were serving. And what we found was that nearly 70% of our membership actually was was not Democrat at all. We were looking at people that are moderates, people that are independents, people that are Republicans, and people that are undecided. The Democratic side of the organization is very tiny, and it was uh, it was great to capture that nonpartisan aspect of our membership and looking at the small percentages of each segment of that. So, you know, uh, I don't remember off the top of my head exactly the, the percentage that we were Democrat, Republican, independent, but it was like 20% Democrat, 30% Republican and like another 30% independent or moderate. And then there was a percentage of people that just didn't voice one or the they other. They didn't necessarily out of all three identify of those. as one or the other. They didn't want to identify as a, an independent or a moderate or an unaffiliated voter. They just didn't answer the question. So we, we don't know for sure, but what, what came out of that demographic study was, Beyond the fact that we're so nonpartisan that we represent aspects of the political spectrum from one side completely to the other was the age demographic that we also represent, which I think has been elusive to a lot of organizations in the conservation community. What shook out there was that we were about 68% of our membership was uh, below the age of 45, 45 or younger. And... And I think that's a unique segment of our population that we've all been trying to reach. And for one reason or another, you know, that sort of millennial population, but also the fringe side of the millennial population, the people that are going to be in our roles one day, whether or not they're conservation leaders or working for state fish and wildlife management agency, what we have the unique opportunity to do now is influence their behavior and their mindset about conservation and help instill these values that some people in our parents' generation, for example, feel are a little bit lost. You know, people are increasingly disconnected from nature and they're attached to their electronic devices more than they ever have been before. And um, I have a daughter and I'm worried about that for her. And, and I know that, uh, the, the generations that are involved in our community see the intermingle of technology and the, the way we've been moving as a society is, is a concern for the future of our sports and our traditions and our heritage. 
particularly those of us that hunt fish and enjoy that outside time so tremendously. And we on purpose want to be disconnected from all that. How do we get to the people that grew up on technology and make sure that they're invested and have those values as strongly held as we do and ensure that they move forward so our traditions and that legacy that we hand down to them doesn't become jeopardized over time. Man, David, did you set the fire alarm there? I was kind of curious what that was. It was like, it was like it, Flash. It, it, I, I didn't know if that was like a, a, a thing that you guys that's a, pre, that, pre-cued that's to a, tell that, me to stop talking because no, I was how rambling. I, it lets me know I'm supposed to move on to the next question. <laughs> I was like rambling on there, right? <laughs> no, it just, no, that was, the, uh, the fire alarm went off for a second <laughs> yeah, in a hotel, was... so we have no idea. But we're not going to worry about it. We're going to pretend like it never happened. Um, so, you know, next question. So, I, so first of all, you guys, you, you've nailed it. So we figured out uh, we figured out what the uh, fire alarm was. Apparently, when you're in one of the handicap rooms, there's a button on the outside of the door that Ryan Bronson from Federal Premium Ammunition can push when he's demanding to enter into your podcast, which he's not going to get to enter into this one, but we're going to do another podcast with Ryan coming up. We'll probably hear him in the background. He's going to probably yeah. chime in. Mr. Outdoors in the house. <laughs> yeah, well, go yeah. ahead, Ryan. Interrupt us. I'm just going to interrupt. Yeah, interrupt <laughs> us. So... Uh, so now we know, not a fire alarm. No, so that it's noise entirely heard. appropriate that they gave Nephi the handicap room, though. I just think it's bizarre. <laughs> so we have there's a light on the wall up here, and when you hit the, the yeah, well, I'm and a, I want to come back to that because you're I'm yeah, a tough sleeper. Uh, I totally missed that <laughs> yeah. comment, John. <laughs> I was so focused on the fact that when you pu- push that button, it doesn't it doesn't go yeah. ding dong. Notice it it's, takes Dave. Dave's the one that's a little slow. Yeah, no, I, I I miss stuff. Well, he's also extremely safety oriented. You know, safety is no accident, right? I, I I don't know. If there's a person I'm good, I'm not gonna ever give Dave Wilms like the, the like Mr. Safety. That's not your guy. I don't know that what you're talking about. I am. I so we'll I am get back there later. Hypothermia, fine. man. That, I have so, only almost had hypothermia. Okay. Like if I were taking my core body chem- temperature, it probably never dropped below like ninety. So your listeners, half, so your so your members, and this is the, the membership of Backcountry Hunters Anglers. This is what you guys have done phenomenally on what you're talking about. Yeah. You guys reach a demographic that really a lot of the organizations, the hunting organizations, they just don't touch. You know, it's that 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 young demographic, that you know, college age, that you know, new professional, um, people who are you know just starting out in in life, if you will. Yeah. You know, like you guys really, you guys really identify with that group, and I understand. But how? No, you say. I mean, you say you understand. I. Here's so my I, here's there's, my there's, theory. Tell me if I'm wrong. Well, but so the, so I want to before you say your theory. There, so there are dozens of groups yeah. out there, dozens of organizations out there that want to know how did BHA capture this lightning in a bottle? How did you get millennials motivated to do anything? Here's my theory. No. <laughs> do you know this already? Should I save my theory because I think I know. No, I mean, present your theory. Let's 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 talk about it. So everybody's sitting around in this room. We're all about that same. We're like we're all we all we're on the top end of your age group of your sixty eight percenters. Right. We're all millennials. Yeah, I'm sure we are. So, <laughs> <laughs> but the, I don't know what's the age cut off. The, the, the gray in our beards uh, belies that fact. When you're looking at the guys that you want that you're going to go out and hunt with, and I'm going to go out and hunt yeah. with, a lot of times we like we're lucky if we have you know at least you know we're 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 really happy that we have a four wheel drive truck. That's a big deal for us, right? We don't have, especially when we're starting out, we don't have, a, you know, a safe full of rifles. We've got a rifle. We've got a backpack. We don't own a ranch. You know, most of us are guys that, like, when we get to go hunt, where are we hunting? We're getting to a trailhead. We're getting a couple of our buddies who are as cheap as Dave Wilms here, who's like like the guy over here with the using a plastic bag for his rain gear. That's who we all are when we're starting out. Yeah. And that's BHA. It's guys who are really, I think... They're just, you know, they, they're starting out. And even if they've been doing it for their whole lives, they're still, you know, in life, they don't, in my mind, it's not a group that's, you know, it's a group that doesn't take for granted the public lands because that's what they have access to. Right. And so I think, I mean, that's my, my take on it is, you know. I'll I'll bet, I'll bet John's take is shorter than that. (laughs) And more to the point. Actually, uh, those of, 
the people that know me know that I'm not known for my brevity, right? I, I can I can drone on and I and on appreciate and, that. And uh, <laughs> so so I'm not sure I can make that. I, I, you guys, I promise, David. I'll be back and I'm gonna go to the gym and work out. Probably head to the bar, have a couple of drinks. I'll be back. We'll see you, see where you are in this process. Uh, I think that there's not a specific answer to the question. You're not wrong. What you said It's a culmination of a lot of factors that are happening at, at the exact same time. I give a lot of credit to what many consider BHA's founder, Mike Beagle, the gentleman that hosted that campfire in the South Cascades of Oregon back in 2004 and brought together these people. He's a former military guy, and uh, there were a lot of uh, former retired uh, active duty military members that were attracted to BHA because if you're hunting the backcountry, if you're fishing the backcountry, it's not easy thing to get into if you're getting into a wilderness area you've either got horses or you've got thigh power and you're putting the miles in on your feet and you've got more invested in your boots than your beer belly and and those guys know the rewards that come from hunting those places because the deeper you go the further away you get from people and roads and traffic and the intensity that is our normal everyday lives, the better the hunting and fishing is because the critters don't like that kind of intensity either. They want to be as far away from it as possible either. So you you get the big bulls, you get the big bucks, and you have the undisturbed trout streams that you can catch monster cutthroat trout and, and other native species on. It's, it's awesome. And so I think there's the the idea that some of the – the millennial generation, some of the, the younger folks are really into fitness and doing things the hard way. And we saw the birth of like all these hardcore adventure races and uh, and you see people like really attracted to testing themselves against the elements. And they realize that the original test against the elements was not doing X game style, like Trojan events or or whatever the the gladiator style events that you have out there. I don't want to use any of the official names, like in case they're trademarked. They don't want to come after your podcast, but yeah. you know what I'm talking about. You we know, you're that. you're crawling in the mud and you're getting electrocuted by stuff. And like, you know, the original way of testing yourself against the elements was not to get eaten. Taking <laughs> Dave in the in the woods with you with his uh, plastic trash bag raincoat, having him survive hypothermia twelve miles deep into the backcountry. And killing a bull elk and and packing it out in three trips and and really having that moment where you were testing yourself against nature, you're like you, there's some touch and go moments there, or you found yourself cliffed out on a on a perch that you weren't quite sure about, but the explorer in you felt like the need to go look at it, and and then you realize that you climbed out onto something you probably shouldn't have with a a 30 pound pack on your back, and and we've all kind of been in those places. And so that kind of moment, I think, makes people like really feel alive and excited. But also, uh, we we're a young group, and we're a small organization, so we're pretty nimble, and we're able to make decisions quickly, we're able to react to things quickly, and so I think people like the idea of being a part of a group that is able to be really active and in the moment, and engaged in issues, and as an organization that doesn't shy away from making decisions sometimes when they're unpopular. Uh, I think that's also attractive to people. Like there, there have been moments in time where there's the right thing to do and it may be unpopular and it may create uh, consternation with some of the, the people you interact with in that space, but testing those boundaries along the way, I think it's also like a little bit refreshing too. Like, so you got, yeah. I mean, you guys, you're, you're a young group. Yeah. And so with that comes growing pains, and sometimes those growing pains are figuring out. You know, sometimes to be frank, like there are situations where you guys have found yourselves in that probably were uncomfortable. You know, where you know, for example, you guys, you know, with interior on the on the issue of bears ears. Um, you know, that's stuff that some other organizations may not have waded into because, right, there's political pressure that comes from that. That had, I mean, that's, but for you guys, that's got to be, that's a learning experience, right? I mean, this, this is a new organization. It's a young organization. 
how do you how do you learn from those experiences and i mean what does that what does that teach you i mean that's a that is a good example like you know, bears here specifically is not a a landscape we were involved in one way or another but bears ears was a part of a greater effort to evaluate national monument designations and uh while bears ears wasn't like a specific place that we had any concerns over one way or the other we were concerned about the potential erosion of landscape designations that were put in place by former presidents and former administrations and the legacy and law of one of who we consider a conservation, you know, icon, Theodore Roosevelt, one of the original um, politicians that helped put some of these laws in place. The, the Antiquities Act was, you know, really a legacy left behind by Theodore Roosevelt. And, and I think a lot of people in our community put him up on a pedestal. And so the idea that we would possibly erode some part of TR's legacy was problematic for us and problematic for our community, but there are a lot of pretty cool national monuments that a lot of us hunt and fish in. Uh, you know, whether you're in Montana and you're hunting the Missouri River breaks, you're here in Colorado and you're chasing some of the biggest trout you can in Browns Canyon, there are these really awesome landscapes that were protected for real reasons. And, and so the idea that some of that might be unraveled was uh, a huge concern for us. And while it may have been unpopular at the time to say anything detrimental to the administration, it was one of those decisions that we made because we felt like it was the right thing to do because it was the right thing for the resource. It was the right thing for fish and wildlife and it was the right thing for the future of hunting and fishing. So and you guys so, weren't necessarily looking at, so I think a lot of people frame it as like, what about, you know, bears ears, that one, you guys weren't looking at bears ears, that one you were looking at, the legacy, like what is this big picture? What is the what is the precedent we're setting? Is what you're saying you were looking at? It's like absolutely. Where does it go from here? Yeah, Bears Ears was not a specific thing that we were concerned with as a particular landscape. It was the overall uh, potential unraveling of the Antiquities Act. One of the gifts that the TR left all of us, and and we have been strong proponents of national monument designations in the Antiquities Act when used judiciously and for the right reasons in the right places. And we actually issued a, a really cool report that was a culmination of feedback from uh, a number of partners in the, the hunting and fishing community, a number of uh, outdoor businesses uh, from the hunting and fishing side, whether it's you know, uh, ammunition companies, gun manufacturers, fly fishing companies, uh, people that provide the equipment and gear that we need to go hunting and fishing. We all got on board with this report, and we actually developed a list of tenants that said, this is the way to designate national monuments. And if you don't follow these tenants, then in some way you're, you're missing the boat. You're missing the reason why we should be protecting valuable landscapes. And these tenants, you know, we feel like should be the standard and, and regarded by any administration at any point in time as the way to look at future designations, whether they're administrative in nature under the Antiquities Act or legislative in nature through acts of Congress. There are a list of things that we don't want to call demands because we don't want to try and you know force these things onto decision makers. But if you care about the interests of hunters and anglers and the stakeholders that are really invested in these landscapes because we're the people actually spending the most time in these places, then we encourage you to follow these tenets that we've established. And a lot of them look at things like ensuring that multiple use management agencies are holding hunting and fishing access as the number one high end part of why we care about these places and where they've done designations that didn't meet those tenets. We've been the first ones to speak out. For example, I'm working in California right now on a Castle Mounds National Monument, which was designated under the Obama administration uh, and, and not necessarily because of any specific uh, uh, effort to unravel hunting access, but because of, of an oversight, that property was placed in a National Park Service ownership, and and there, there was an interpretation that precluded hunting access. And so we've been one of the first groups out in front of that saying, like, we got to fix that. And we've been working with Congressman Cook's office in California 
and uh, uh, Senator Feinstein's office in California and groups like the Wild Sheep Foundation and the conservation community to uh, attempt to reverse that. We're proposing legislation that would actually eliminate that national monument and take that acreage that's the current national monument, fold it into the adjacent Mojave National Preserve so that we can restore hunting access there, which is important to our members in California, but also going back to my earlier comments about uh, establishing these tenants for monument designations helps make it more consistent with how we want to see these things take place. So, you know, BHA is trying to be an organization that measures people, decision makers, and actions by their merits and not by the political ties that they may have. So whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you're making these decisions, we want to hold you accountable in the same way. And if you're somehow eroding hunting and fishing access or you are somehow uh, impairing fish and wildlife habitat, we want to make those corrections in the right way and, and ensure that we can continue those traditions going forward. I, that's, that's awesome. And you brought up something that I think, uh, you know, when you said Republican or Democrat, and we already talked about, you know, you, you know, your membership breakout, the leadership of backcountry hunters and anglers, it's safe to say your board members, you, other staff, you guys also, there's, there's not a, there's not an identifier for party next to people's names in terms of like, you, you don't, I mean, you guys cover the gamut, right? Right. So next question, true or false. So you talked about this, you guys, and you brought this up, you guys concentrate on lands issues. So uh, true, uh, member of, I'm an NRA member. Yeah. Can I still be a member of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers? Of course. Yeah. We don't, we don't discriminate. Like, we welcome everyone anywhere. I would say if you want to become a member of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, we're building a coalition of the willing. If you like what we do, if you like public lands and waters, if you like access and opportunity for hunting and fishing, and you want an organization that's going to stand up for fair chase and promote the traditions and heritage that I think a lot of us grew up on, but the new people to hunting and fishing uh, want to emulate. Like We want to set a responsible example for how to behave as hunters and anglers, but also ensure that we have great places to hunt and fish going forward. And if you're on board with that, you're welcome in our in our group. And the reason I asked is because I think that there's this there's a thought process out there where you said you guys concentrate on lands and waters. And so I've heard people say before, how come backcountry hunters and anglers hasn't weighed in on the Second Amendment? Yeah. And so, I mean, in brief, you guys do have a position on that, correct? 100%. Yeah. What is that? We have a – so we – as an organization, we issue policy statements. We come together as an organization. We bring our chapters. We're, we're a grassroots organization, meaning we have dues-paying members that join BHA, and they are assigned to a chapter based on where they live. And so we have geographical representation across the continent. We're a North American organization, and our continental presence extends to 39 states, two Canadian provinces, and Washington, D.C. So if you're a part of... The organization, you're connected to a chapter at some level, and we want to empower our chapter leaders and our board members and our individual members, in addition to the staff that make up BHA, to be a part of how we set policy positions. So we've established a process to set these policy positions together by bringing everyone together into the decision-making process. And one of our uh, most early policy statements back then they were actually resolutions we were actually writing them in resolution format but we were like, as therefore exactly <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah. which are which are like nice and like kind of a, a throwback to the old way of doing things but not actually very usable and exportable and we want to be able to share these policy statements and and have them be utilized by our chapters and and be able to share them with decision makers so they actually are understandable so we've repackaged them but um our Second Amendment policy statement was one of the original statements. It was under the old resolutions process, but the first actual statement where we wanted to make it 100% clear without any whereas clauses or anything like that, it said, BHA is an organization that supports the Second Amendment. We absolutely stand up for it. It's one of the tenets of our country as uh, a constitution-driven organization that cares about the heritage of how we became uh, as a as a country itself, like back in the early days, and and as much as public lands and waters and 
and that birthright that we hold so dear that that wasn't necessarily guaranteed as an amendment uh, in the early days of the country, but has sort of become regarded that way amongst our membership. It, it really should be a constitutional right that is inherited and passed down to future generations. Like this, this concept of public lands and waters becomes so central to who we are as a country. And in a lot of ways, the envy of the world where if you want to hunt and fish in some countries, it's the king's domain and the monarchy and, and the, the wealthy privilege have the ability to go out and hunt fish. We have this great country that has this tremendous resource that's accessible to every single person anywhere of any means. And we're all contributing it to a meaningful way where whether you're Ryan Bronson over there on the, the industry side, putting money into Pittman Robertson dollars, whether you're on the fishing side, putting money into Dingle Johnson dollars, whether you're an individual hunter angler, putting money into license dollars, everything matters. And second amendment rights matter. And BHA is hundred percent on board with defending our second amendment rights you know, the way I phrase it is a safe full of guns does me no good if I have no place to go hunt and fish and, and use my guns for hunting. But if I don't have my guns in the safe, I can't go hunting with them either. And I'm an archery hunter too. Uh, I feel like we got left out early on. <laughs> like, where, where's my amendment about my bows oh, and cool. arrows, right? Like, and, and I'm not getting like... A bows bo and arm. Bows, bows with wheels uh, versus yeah. long bows and recurves and all that good I stuff. Can, but Isn't that implicit? <laughs> but I, I feel like it should be somehow incorporated in and there. I, I think so it's our implicit archer, in the our language. Our archery brethren, right? Like, yeah, it's not the think, right to bear firearms. Yeah, it's, it's the right to bear arms. Right, right. right. Like a well-armed militia, and yeah. Phasers doesn't when, doesn't when matter how you're armed, right. right? Now that shouldn't extend to mannequins, right? Like we can't have a bunch of department store armies full of mannequin arms out there. Bear but arms. I, well, uh, and I mean, and like, like hairy, like actual. And if, and if we're yeah, if we're getting into the right to, arms, right? To, I was about to take my shirt off. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <Grr. laughs> <laughs> I was just about to go there. You stopped me. Yeah. Speaking uh, of bears, uh, there's been plenty of too much beer. I, I've got it with with Ryan here. I got to do something. Yeah, uh, and he doesn't have a headset on to you know to pipe you up. Get, right you guys now. can get real close together. Like maybe. Yeah, like, let him talk into your mic. No, so, it's attached so, to your head. So I, I don't. It was a couple of episodes ago. Uh, we made some reference to, uh, or we I did. I made some reference to the Magna Carta. And then, <laughs> and then Ryan's got this oh, got, no. got his podcast on gravel, and on his on his last episode, Our sister podcast, yeah, on his last episode of his podcast, he made made some you know, I don't even know like underhanded, snide, sarcastic remark about how bitter. we how, how we referenced the Magna Carta, angry and, and I, bitter, and, and, and I challenged I challenged him. I said, now now you have to reference the Magna Carta in you know in your next four podcasts. But I'm going to do it here. I just did like half a dozen times. But I'm going to actually reference it because of something John said. Completely un. And when he was talking about firearms, right, he he also started talking about um, you know the the right the, this inherent right to access right you're talking about the right to access uh water and land and so forth that and that under the crown you know maybe that that was that only existed for certain people yeah the right? wealthy the, the wealthy privileged part right. of society but that was a perverted interpretation of the magna carta that yeah. came that came several hundred years after the Magna Carta was actually originally uh, drafted. The original in, the original Magna Carta, it, like that's the first place where you see some sort of a reference to a public trust doctrine. Yeah, like our whole public trust doctrine that we rely on for the North American model of wildlife management. In some ways, you can point back to the Magna Carta for right because you can it, you know it's saying you know that there there are these places like uh, the air, the water. Uh, and, and land and, and wildlife that are inherently everybody's and nobody's. Um, yeah. And then fast forward a couple hundred years ago and, and some king, probably a Charles or a James or something, I don't know uh, which one, Chuck. but I think it's probably pretty reasonable to, or George. King Chuck. Um, anyway, <laughs> one of these kings you know, made this decision that, all right, somebody's got to hold these in that trust, yeah, may as well be me, <laughs> uh, and hence that system was born, right? Yes. Uh, and uh, and so now when we talk about you know, the 
the the crown's wildlife and the crown's water and so it was like some dude a few hundred years ago misinterpreted the magna carta <laughs> and it was like i'm going to be that guy that holds all of this stuff in trust for everybody else but really you know for the benefit of everybody i'm not going to let anybody i when you were saying that I, just, I i pictured some some kingly figure at some giant wooden table at a castle with the mm. flagons of ale yeah, and like meats like. before him and <laughs> and he's had a he's had a few uh many mugs of ale and he's making these decisions he's got a and chalice like, i a still declare chalice. it right <laughs> it, it is so yeah <laughs> so I, but no i think i think what what you're saying is is kind of spot on but it also uh pretty cool for the for the venue we're in right like, you know, we're we're recording this from a hotel room, but we're at the 84th North American Conference on Wildlife and Natural Resources. What I consider sort of the the pinnacle of how we've evolved as a society into a system of fish and wildlife management becomes so critical to why we even have opportunities to hunt and fish today. When you're looking at the turn of the century, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, market hunting. The, the fact that we didn't have this model of management in place at all and wildlife populations were being decimated around the country and we, we were looking at expert <clears throat> extirpation of big game species. You know, hunters and anglers were the first sort of leaders in the conservation community to come together and help really reinforce this idea that we needed to make sure that fish and wildlife were here for future generations. We need to put some standards in place. The public trust doctrine was this, this great idea about having wildlife held and managed for the benefit and for the public trust. And we've evolved that into this North American model of fish and wildlife conservation, which I think a lot of people like to reference, but don't fully ever understand each of the components for. And I think we have an obligation to make sure we don't forget about what that actually means. Make sure that there are examples that we can push forward and that we're also not so myopic that we would forget to reconsider them along the way and adapt and grow as things change as we have different market conditions putting impacts on fish and wildlife as we have different uh, 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 social and societal changes along the way. Like We have to adapt to some of those things so we can push the North American model forward, keep it modern, keep it relevant, and make sure that we have those important opportunities for hunting and fishing. But, you know, something you guys said earlier kind of struck me too that was, was important to, I think, elevate as as we look at the opportunity to go hunting and fishing we have wild places these things don't happen by accident right like it takes all of us being active participants we all do our part and i think the cool part about our country the cool part about the way we are as a society is is not that we uh have this divisive political rhetoric that sometimes gets captured by the media but if we distill things down, I, everyone in this country, everything that we do, every, someone cares about wild things at some level. Some Someone cares about wildlife at some level. They may not hunt fish. They may not be out backpacking every summer. But people like wild places and wild things. And I think if we appeal to that commonality amongst us, then there's still hope for continuing to do the right thing going forward. And I think that's really key to really – bringing the, the future generations that follow us into this equation is making sure that we have those places and reminding them, you know, giving maybe a history lesson on the Magna Carta is a, is a cool part of it, but also making it relevant for today. And that's something that... I feel like you just insulted me right there. I'm not insulted. <laughs> it's like, that was cool and all. I'll give you your five man, bucks man, you are so irrelevant at this point. I think, but... but <laughs> <laughs> but we have to make it relevant for people like like academics like nerdy uh, uh, uh nerdy people like me and you like the like want to walk out <laughs> and get and get into the policy side of things like we love that historical reference and we want to get like that's where we live at but the people that matter most going forward are maybe not the same way you and I are and we have to make 
we have to translate it for them for now and and hope yeah. that some of them will want to nerd out in the policy stuff the same way you and I want you to. Just, you just ruined what I was going to do next. What? Uh, yeah, I was going to really nerd out hard and do another history lesson. I'll save that for do a time it. when you're not here. So I'm going uh, to I'm going to help you move along. No, 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 I'm gonna, no, no, I'm going to move along. I was going to tell I'm going to just tee up what I was we'll tee this up for another day. But there's such a good he, he like he left the perfect thing for me to say this. Like when you start talking about you know what it made me think when you said future Didn't generations. Didn't even let me finish my thought. I know I interrupted you. We got to do it. We'll <laughs> say, do it. Let's do it. Let's make we, this part 2. We hold these choose to be self-evident. And for like that. these are things that are these things are these are things that are bigger than a moment. They're bigger, you know. They are timeless. The from the Magna Carta to here. There you go. Sorry, I'm not really sorry, but all right. Now can I? Yeah. You sure? Uh, I'm yeah. gonna give you. I'm gonna I, pause. We're I, gonna that, we're gonna that, we're gonna have some I, uh, we're gonna have some dead air. How about? I just want to make sure you're done. Two, three. <laughs> so here's what I was gonna do. And I'll I'm gonna, I'm, I'll I'll do this some other time, but I wanted to just sort of tee this thing up. Uh, I have this theory, and part of the reason I'm just teeing it up is I'm still kind of fleshing it out. I have this theory. Uh, when you go back in time, and I, I study Supreme Court case law a lot uh, to follow the progression of how we how we got a public trust doctrine, how we have uh, states being viewed as the 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 trustee of the resource for the people, um, right? And then fast forward and watching that get eroded uh, over the course of decades by su Supreme Court case law. And there were really two Supreme Court justices that that were really responsible for first giving or, or acknowledging or recognizing all of this authority for the states to manage wildlife. And so this is, I think it was Justice White, um, a famous case of Gear versus Connecticut, 1896, uh, you know, propped up this theory of state management of wildlife. He, ha he actually had a lesser known case about a decade later that reinforced it and actually had some some language in there that said uh, state law is, or any federal law that's passed dealing with wildlife has to be consistent with state law, not the other way around, yeah. right? Uh, kind of fascinating, right? It was at this moment in time when these two cases were coming out, uh, written by this particular justice, that we started seeing state came and fish commissions come online, game wardens get hired, licenses start being issued uh, around the country. We really saw the the framework, the initial framework for the North American model happen. Fast forward uh, to about 1920 and the famous Oliver Wendell Holmes. I believe that's the justice at the time that did this. And he's the one that really started reversing course on that, you know, and, and suggesting that it's the other way around, that the, the federal, you know, th that state law has to be consistent with federal law, and to the extent that they're inconsistent, federal law is supreme under the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution. And because of that, we started to have sort of this erosion of, the, uh, of, of some of these principles from the late 1800s, early 1900s, and you started to see the rise of a lot more encroachment by the federal government in uh, some of the laws that were passed, you know, superseding some state laws, and, and in, in starting to get more and more involved in wildlife management. Uh, I, I kind of wonder what would have happened if it had been the reverse, if we'd actually have a North American model that we have today. Uh, if these justices came in in a reverse order and the case law that you had in the early 1900s, late 1800s, actually was you know, more of what we we had you know, later in the 20th century, would we have would we actually have the North American model the way we have it today, or would it, or would it really be a more a federalized system rather than this this state system? I'm just pontificating, uh, but yes, um, yes. But, no, it, it but be I'm like going to dive into it more. It's super nerdy. I'm going to dive into. Nerdy. I'm going to dive into it more. I'm probably going to write something about it. You should it save that for point. your class. Um, for all you students in Dave's class who are looking to really, really <laughs> brown nose, because he teaches this class at the University of Wyoming, so everybody knows. Like, if you want some extra credit points, just brownie points, you just remember this conversation that Dave just had and go expound on it with him next no. Tuesday night at the University of Wyoming. In our gentlemen. podcast, I want to be invited because I'd love to talk about that more, too. I, I, I have a similar academic interest in exploring, like, the what-ifs, like, because you we I should don't, probably we don't step know out if, of this right? conversation. It's this super uh, nerdy... Um, Is it, like... Yeah, I think some of that was pivotal, and we don't realize it. But if we go back and look at it and really evaluate it, we can realize that it was, and maybe draw more attention to it than ever has been drawn to it. But 
give right. credit where credit's deserved, but also like ask the what if questions like like what was the good part of it? What what were some of the bad you parts know, like, of it too, right? There's a Seinfeld reference for everything, right? Yeah. What would our bizarro wildlife world look like? Yeah. You know, had these justices been flipped. Um but it all happens for a reason, Dave. But but Ryan Bronson's like I said, leaving not, is probably yeah, going to ring the doorbell. I've bored so many people now. Uh, but what I'm, but really, what I want to do, uh, you know, because we're you you mentioned it, John. We're at this this sort of pinnacle conference right now, right? And and this has just become the party room. And something, yeah, more people entered. This is fantastic. And uh, uh, so we just we're, we're at this pinnacle conference for for uh, wildlife professionals around the country. And something, you know, something pretty big happened this morning. Yeah, absolutely. And I, w- I kind of want to get your thoughts on it. Uh, so I know what you're talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about. So I don't. I'll let you. I'll let you tee it up, and, All right. and, and then give give us your thoughts on it. And then, uh, yeah. What are the? I we sponsored a breakfast yesterday at the North American, and um, and one of the the things I really wanted to highlight was the the three areas that. The BHA focuses our energy on, which is is fair chase, conservation of our public lands and waters, and access and opportunity. And and one of the 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 most important places that we're doing work right now in that public lands and water space is around migratory corridors and connectivity for fish and wildlife habitat. But uh, really giving credit to the Department of Interior under Secretary Zinke for his order thirty three sixty two. Uh, which would uh, designate a coordinator, which is Casey Stemler now, as uh, many of us know. He's a he's a great guy, an old friend, and with the fish, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who's in charge of uh, really carrying out the the directive set forth under that secretarial order to elevate consideration of big game migratory corridors um, and winter range specifically, and and that was. A, a real welcome, uh, uh, I guess, initiative that the Department of Interior put in place for hunters and people that care about wildlife that I think we all recognized was important, but it was nice to see it elevated to that level and like really have some focus put into it because migratory corridor connectivity is incredibly important as we as we see the need for more resilient landscapes with cumulative impacts, whether it's it's drought, it's invasive species, it's development in some form or another. There are these cumulative impacts, and sometimes fish and wildlife get the short end of the stick. And this was a way to really elevate the prioritization for the most sensitive parts of uh, wildlife habitat that a lot of us care about. And, and starting with big game species and winter range was a place that that I think got a lot of us excited about working together with uh, interior and federal agencies and helping break down some of the silos between state fish and wildlife management agencies and federal land management agencies. So we have like the states managing the, the wildlife piece and we have the federal agencies managing the habitat essentially. This is a helpful way to bring those two people together, kind of work across jurisdictional boundaries. And, and this morning, uh, Secretary, Acting Secretary Bernhardt announced uh, an expansion of that secretarial order so that we're now moving into summer range habitat, which is really important too in those those corridor connectivities in summer range, but also looking beyond uh, specific big game species like, like mule deer and pronghorn and elk and, and identifying other important species like sheep and moose and and other important elements of our or a system of wildlife management that rely on some of these corridors and making a, a holistic approach that takes a look at a handful of species that need some some strong attention right now and prioritizing those. And and I think it's a smart way to scale up, right? Like we can't go whole hog and go after every single species everywhere, aquatic, terrestrial at the same time. Let's scale to the resources that are available now Let's do a great job at addressing some important needs out of the gates. And so it was exciting to hear that news this morning. And I, and I believe that the, the order was officially signed this evening. We'll see that come out tomorrow morning in the Federal Register. And I, I think it's a it's cause for our community to really celebrate and, and give the administration credit for, 
for building on something great that was started under Secretary Zinke and, and continuing forward and evolving under Secretary, Acting Secretary Bernhardt. Now, now I'd, be, I'd be remiss if I, if I didn't at least say on, that on paper, right? On paper right now, it looks good. It's, a, yeah. it's positive. But the devil's in the details and how you implement. And it I've, always is. I've seen how it's been implemented so far, and there are uh, there are opportunities for improvement. I'll just put it that way. Uh, there are opportunities for improvement. Yeah. Um, you know to you know, to make it to make it as effective as it can be. And I don't really want to get it. I don't think you know it'd take too long to get into all of the all the details. Of, you know, and really wonk out. But just know, yeah, I I agree. I think it's a it's a it's very positive, right? We need to be protecting these places, and frankly, we have we know we have so much science now to support, uh, to support designations, right? To support putting resources into protecting these places and and preserving these migration routes. Yeah, um, uh, I want to actually give your former boss a lot of credit for helping it get this far. I think the state of Wyoming has been an incredible leader in one. Uh, everything. They say everything. Just everything, say everything. Right? Yeah. Everything under the history of mankind ever. Yeah, ever. Uh, uh, keep going. Yeah. I like it. But but specifically, what I wanted to say was, uh, you know, Governor Mead and and uh, Wyoming Game and Fish really went a long way to helping establish some of the early migratory corridors, and you guys put together some incredible academics. You know, whether it's the the great team of scientists coming out of Laramie to help lead the Mule Deer Initiative and, Id- and identify some of these iconic corridors, and whether it's Joe who's taken some of those amazing photographs that have captured the path of the pronghorn, this incredible 120 mile migration. Uh, you know, I, I at our breakfast yesterday I featured that really iconic photo of his where it captured that doe right in the middle of the Green River, like really up close. And the whole herd's behind her, and it's so fantastic. And he's got that great one of that that really nice mule deer buck. And we're talking about some of these, you know, whether it's the Red Desert to Hoback, and 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 for us at, at BHA, like that's an important landscape. You know, you're on the northern end. You're talking about Little Mountain, some of these really special places. I think Wyoming's helped lead the way for acknowledging the importance of migratory corridors and like telling the story that people outside of our community need to know about in a way that's compelling. You know, you have these cool coffee table books that have all these incredible pictures from Joe, but we're telling the story about what a migratory corridor really means. Because if if we're talking about it on paper, like you said, it sounds good, but we can't visualize it. And there are definitely ways to improve. I consider it, we're in the early stages. We're still figuring things out. And we're still putting the right resources in place. We're still trying to figure out the best way to empower states to be a part of this. There's a, a really cool transportation component of this. We're talking about overpasses and underpasses right. for wildlife. And by the way, the state of Wyoming last year, uh, the legislature passed a bill to for a conservation license plate where the money uh, raised from the sale oh, I didn't of know that. license That's plate. That's awesome. Yeah, so the money, you, the money raised for the passes. sale of the, that license plate goes towards helping fund. Now, helping as in... It, like it, I don't even know what it, it probably does, won't pay for the survey work, but it's a drop. It's a drop in the bucket, but it it's symbolic, right? It helpful for overpasses, underpasses, for passages over highways and other barriers for uh, for wildlife. What I like about that, and uh, and I I think people get this in some way too, but it's worth pointing it out, even if it is a small amount of money, giving people an opportunity to like fly the colors, so to speak, and put that on their car and say they care about it is a way to help spread the message and get other people to care about it too. I mean, right. It's silly, symbolic. Like, silly, like, silly like, thing. like, symbolic we, have, like thing. we have our own, like BHA has our own license plate in Montana. This yeah, but everybody has plate. their own license plate in Montana. I That's think I, I think I have a license plate <laughs> in Montana. Like it's like a fifty dollar fee, and you know, like a, a what's you know, yours? What's it have on like, it? On what's a, yours? Huh? What's it look like? What's yours I don't know. Remember, like? so remember those etch a sketches? I probably just doodled something on that and mm-hmm. sent it up there with my fifty bucks. And I have a yeah. you know etch a sketch license plate. In I, Montana. Think, I think Bronson made him integrate the federal premium logo into it. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure it is. <laughs> I don't actually. I'd probably buy that. Well, if somebody, <laughs> if, if somebody, I take back. Somebody gave it to me. I put it on my car. <laughs> <laughs> You run it forever. 
I, 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 just so know. everyone knows, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna maybe I should save this for when Bronson's on the podcast. We're doing another one, but Dave Bronson sends him, he sends him a sweatshirt. Hmm. And last night we we're talking about this. We were at your pint night, yeah. the BHA pint night last night, with a bunch of so congratulations, great event. Thanks. And just so you know, like, uh, and again. With the North American here, and then a, a bunch of different, you know, if you live in Kentucky or Pennsylvania or Oregon or Texas, your directors came and they all were sitting in this, you know, at this pine night, look, watching this huge group of 15, of not 15, of 21 to 40 year old folks, you know, around there at the, at the tarantula, like, you know. Around there. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, but anyway, it was legal, folks. I promise. <laughs> we were talking about Dave, and I just I told, was more inferring the forty part. <laughs> <laughs> and I told I told Ryan best investment he ever made was was giving Dave a federal premium ammunition sweatshirt because like that sweatshirt will now appear on every photo that Dave is in for the next thirty years. That sweatshirt is in that photo. It's on him right now. That's a that's a good reminder to get Dave a sweatshirt from backcountry yeah. and anglers right now, man. If if I have it, I will wear it. I just am very. <clears throat> so I took this picture. You're a conservationist no, 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 no. Gonna, of clothing. I'm going to see Nephi has one of our, uh, our hats on his desk I, over I, here, though. I'm gonna. I got it. Yeah, right. Yeah. No, that's a nice hat. Uh, you can't have it. My hat's pretty nice too. It's original. Mm-hmm. It's a little, <laughs> <laughs> like it might be the first baseball cap ever made. It's, <laughs> it looks like it. Uh, but I, uh, I, I was. I was gonna. I was about to tell. I was about to tell a story. Were you going to tell a story that aimlessly wandered to nothing? No, it had it actually had a that's, point. Oh, that's it actually point. had a point. Uh, and I completely forgot what it was because Nephi interrupted me. Uh, well, it, it was what I do. It was going to be so good. Ryan. It was going to be so good. Uh, It'll come to you. No, it probably won't. I'm getting old enough that uh, you know, you got to you got to really do it when you have it and yeah. and it's gone. You know, whatever <laughs> it was, it's it's fleeting. It's gone. I'm sure it was brilliant enough to be recaptured at some point. Yeah, in cast podcast. it upon the waters; it'll come back. It was it was profound. I guarantee you, it probably had something to do with my cheapness. And uh, oh, I know what it was. I just remembered. That's the a, cheapness. That was, that was the trigger. That was the trigger. That was the trigger. <laughs> <laughs> You're t- talking about me wearing a sweatshirt for 30 years, right? Uh, so if I were to show you my yearbook picture from high school, uh, which I'm not going to do, let's be clear about that. But, but you if I have were, it. But if I were going to show you that picture, well, he said yearbook instead of his underwear. <laughs> I I I wore I wore, uh, I wore a sweater uh, in this. I had this sweater uh, that I wore for this yearbook picture in high school for my senior portrait, whatever. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was going on a date with my wife, <laughs> and I I put that sweater on from your senior photo. From my senior photo. <laughs> Your glamour shot. <laughs> it still fits. It oh, like a glove. Turns out when you go to school, when you go to high school in the nineties, like a really tight like, glove. Like, so I was a high school student in the nineties, right? Like and, Pearl Jam days, right? Everything right. Was baggy. So everything was gigantic. <laughs> and now it's skinny. It, it's it's so now it's form fitting. I've I've really I've filled out since then. Yeah. <laughs> so it it fits perfectly. It's a slim and it's, fit now. It's timeless. It's like yeah. your hunting vest. It's good that's, that the zipper doesn't work anymore. That's why I can wear everything for thirty years. I bought it all in the nineties. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Eddie Vedder. Yeah. <laughs> Thank uh, you, Chris Cornell. Yeah. <laughs> Kurt Cobain. Right. How many more can we come up with? That's right. Yeah. There, was, there was like those are like the big three. Uh, Allison Chains, right? That's my, that's my wedding uh, picture. That's not my. That's not my yearbook yeah. picture. And, and how creepy is it that Ryan Bronson has your wedding picture on his phone? Man, like this is this just got weird. Like it wasn't. Suit, and he spread out eagle on his bed, <laughs> <laughs> looking at my wedding picture right. spread eagle on the bed. <laughs> and he In has, my hotel room. <laughs> room. Oh, this is brilliant. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we've we've officially well, reached, reached a point we, where I think it's ju- we just got to pull the bandaid off and end this thing. <laughs> Ooh, we, man, um, but before we do, yeah. Uh, so I understand you listen to us religiously. You don't listen to a lot of podcasts, but, but this you one only you listen do twice every episode. Right? I'll be honest. You I'm listen a, to I'm this a, podcast I'm a, I'm as a, much as you listen to anything. I'm a, I'm a new podcaster. I, I've just come into it, but I've stumbled into this one, and uh, I'm. I'm full in. All right. I'm on it 100%. So here's how you get on 110%. Uh, Stick this up to 110%. 110%. 11. <laughs> uh, here's what we do. This this podcast works every time 60% of the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Will Ferrell. 
what is it? Hey, I, works sixty percent of the time. I'm right all six, the time. Sixty percent of the time, this podcast works every time. Every time, uh, it's like Sex Panther. Yeah, <laughs> I, I have a, I have a, a glass Sorry, that parents. says that. Um, anyway. <laughs> So we have this thing we do at the end of it, and you're gonna feel real weird having just said this after I after I, you know, ask you this question. Yeah. So at the end of uh, podcast, we have guests on. We ask them. You know, this is it's your, your, your mountain podcast. We're talking about you know issues around you know land, water, wildlife, places that are so important to you that are important to us. You know, you're obviously passionate about it. You have made a career out of it, right? Um, about protecting these places and working for these places. Uh, but I'm I'm sure there's one place. There's got to be a place out there that's that's uniquely important to you, yeah. right? And so that's the question for you. What is your mountain? That's a great question. Uh, I know. And it's it's a cross between like wanting to tell people about my special place, but about wanting to keep it special by not telling anybody, right? It's a conundrum. So I can't tell you it's no tell them creek, right? Uh, but I will say if I had, if I had one place that I think is sacred and special, I have to go back to the roots, go back to all three of our roots, round us out the way we began, go back to the home state of Idaho. And if I said, if, if you drop me in the middle of the Frank Church Wilderness area in central Idaho and uh, and left me there, I could be happy for the rest of my life if I never came out. I can't argue with that. I don't know anybody that can argue with that, except, no, I won't. I, my you have favorite, your special place too. I, I have my favorite place in Idaho. I I, I absolutely love the Sawtooths of Idaho. Part like of the my, Frank Church. Yeah, right on the, the gateway to the Frank. Right Church. on the southern end. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I worked in Stanley, Idaho, uh, growing up. I uh, paid my way through college, being a river guide on the the Mill Fork of the Salmon River and the Main Salmon River, running dailies in the South Fork yeah. of the Payette. And uh, we used I, to go up to uh, Redfish Lake all the time as kids. Nice. Uh, uh, honeymoon I, there with my uh, with my wife up at Redfish oh, cool. Lake and up through the Sawtooths and cool yeah. photos of my dad with his buddies uh, trolling quotation marks in the air with a rowboat and their rods trying to catch salmon at a Redfish Lake and uh, special memories for my whole family back to that place and uh, I, I remember skirting the Rangers in the Iron Creek campground there. Because of the uh, rule for the number of days you could camp out, but when you're a river guide and uh, you couldn't afford to actually rent a cabin to stay in for the whole summer, you're removing your campsite as little as possible, but uh, trying to, to skirt the rangers coming in and get after you. And uh, I have a lot of special memories of Stanley, Idaho, and in the Sawtooth Mountains. And uh, some of my first backpacking trips were there as a young Boy Scout. And a lot of special memories, a lot of special places, and I think it's cool we all share that connection to uh, Idaho like that. No, I, I I do too. I think that's a great place to end it. Um, maybe someday we can go. We should know, do something back together, back right? We should do something together in Idaho. Yeah, we uh, we'll be uh, fatter and slower, and uh, it'll take us longer to get there than it did back in the day. But I look forward to it. I I do too, <laughs> uh, and that's a perfect place to say, yeah, life's about experiences, so go have one. <laughs>